everybody. Thanks so much for coming out to Lecture 7. We're excited to see you guys. We hope everyone had a good spring break. Um, yeah. It's, uh, I know we're starting late and we have a lot to cover, so we're going to get right into it. So a couple of announcements before anything else. The first one is that we have new lab hours. Most of them are on Monday, um, but again, feel free to message us on Discord if these hours don't work for you. Also, all of the officers are really nice, I swear, so they won't bite when you ask them questions. Okay. And also, I want to remind you guys that we have officer elections coming up. So I, we all, we really, really encourage you guys to run for Ops Lead, seriously. I, all of you here showing the initiative of coming at 8 p.m. at night in spring <laughs> quarter shows that you guys are determined and can be Ops Lead. So please, the more of you um, who, who want to do it, the better. So go for it. Um, yeah, or any other officer position, I triple is awesome. If you have any questions about it, feel free to reach out to us, Discord, email, whatever you like. Awesome. And then a couple of logistics. I know that winter was a really difficult quarter for everybody with transitioning from um, online to in-person, um, but this quarter we're going to be having meetings every single Wednesday at around this time so that we can either do a lecture or a project work session because I know it's really helpful to be working with other people for these projects. Um, we have four new projects this quarter. One of them, Creston, worked really, really hard to design, um, and then two of them are our, our capstone projects. Okay. Yeah, so uh, last uh, lecture we were talking about transistors. So I have a question. Does anyone remember how many leads a transistor has? Like three? Awesome. Okay. This is going to be a little bit dangerous, but um, Arthur? Okay. Oh my god, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. Nice job. Nice job. Okay. Okay, and next, what are the two applications of transistors? Anyone? Second question, what are the two applications of transistors? You don't have to list both of them, just one. Blind guess. Go for it. Yeah, go for it. Uh, uh, I feel like, uh, if I remember correctly, one of them uh, was like sort of control yeah, so one of the applications is amplification. So you can take a really, really small amount of current, pass it through a transistor, and you'll have a really large current outside. So that's really good. Do you want another snack? Uh, I think I'm good. Okay, uh, you can give okay. It to someone else. Okay, okay. Um, and then does anyone remember the other um, application? Yeah. Uh, digital logic design? Yeah, exactly. Uh, nice. Okay. Nice job. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, so then the last question. What are some applications of four or wire loops? Yeah. When you want to do something a bunch of times, but you either don't know how many times you want to do it, or um, the amount of times you want to do it varies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. And I think in our project, we use it for noise cancellation. But yeah, anything that needs to be done repetitively. Awesome. OK, so this time on Ops, we're going to be talking about communication protocols. Arrays and functions. And the new project. Hi. Ooh. I'm excited. It's going to be fun. Let's get straight into it. OK, so this section is going to be very concept and theory based. You don't have to completely understand all of this. It's just better when you're trying to apply these communication protocols to have a basic understanding of what they're doing. Um, otherwise, it'll just get really confusing. So. I'll go try to go slow, and it's going to be a lot of content, but feel free to ask questions at any point. So first off, what is a communication protocol? Essentially, it's sending a signal from one source to another, and it's a standardized way of sending these signals. Um, you can think of it as you know, your cell phone. Obviously, this is a worldwide connection, and um, the cellular network is a very vast connection of different electronics that are trying to send signals from each other and then receiving signals as well. So it's really important to have a standardized way of being able to communicate with each other. Otherwise, you know, if one phone company decides to do communication a different way than another, then you wouldn't be able to have a vast uh, and complex uh, network. Um, so that's kind of like the basic of what and why we use communication protocols. 
And before we dive into any of the theory or any of the different types of communication protocol, it's important to understand some basic um, definitions. The first one is a clock signal. We've worked with clock signals before. Does anyone remember what project or what piece of equipment we used to generate a clock signal? Yeah. Uh, uh, five, 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 five. Awesome, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, God. Okay. It got there. It got there. Okay. So, yeah. So, a 555 timer generated a signal that oscillates between high and low, or zeros and ones, if you want to think of it that way. And we can actually coordinate actions based off of this signal here. The next uh, definition is asynchronous, and that just means that you're sending a signal, but you don't have a clock signal to go along with it. So you're just kind of sending signals haphazardly with no real uh, definitive time when you're doing anything. On the flip side, you have a synchronous signal, and that means that you do have a clock signal that's dictating when things are going to happen. The next uh, definition is baud rate, and that's just a rate at which information is being sent. Um, and then the bandwidth is the maximum baud rate. So when people refer to something like a uh, low bandwidth, that just means that you have a low amount of data being uh, sent into your, um, you know, your computer or whatever. So for that reason, you'd have a low quality video or you wouldn't be able to load a lot of um, things on your computer because you're not getting a lot of data in. Okay, so before we um, talk about how to actually build a communication protocol, um, we need to understand the building blocks of what a communication protocol is. And there are two building blocks, the serial and parallel communication systems. And these can be used in conjunction with each other or just completely singular. The first one is serial communication. And this is when data is being sent in one at a time. So in this image here, you see that your bits are kind of lined up in a single file line. So these bits are being sent out one at a time, and then they're being received one at a time as well. And this is a lot slower because obviously you can only process one thing at a time, but for that exact same reason, it's a lot less likely that your data is actually going to be corrupted. And so for that reason, we prefer to use serial communication when we're sending signals over a long distance. On the flip side, we have parallel communication, and this is when data is being sent in all at the same time. If you can see here, all of the data is being sent in at the exact same time, which is denoted by this clock signal. So it's being sent in and then also received at the same time. And because it's being received and uh, received at the same time, it's a lot faster, but for that exact same reason, it's a lot easier for data to be miscommunicated in some way because there's a lot of information coming in. And so for that reason, we use parallel communication for shorter distances. A couple of the different types of serial communication, we mainly work with serial communication because the Arduino Nano supports that. Um, we're only talking about I2C, SPI, also USB is a form of serial communication. And then SCSI, ISA. The, I know the, the naming is weird, there's a lot of letters, but if you understand the basics of one of them is going in one at a time, the other is receiving everything at the same time, then you understand what's going on. All right, so back to the Arduino Nano. You're probably thinking, what the hell am I supposed to use communication protocol for? Actually, the Arduino Nano supports three different types of serial communication. SPI, UART, and I2C. And we'll be breaking down all three of these. That way you can actually implement them in your capstone project and also the new project that Sassy developed. All right, so the first one is UART, which stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Does anyone remember using serial print in some of the, in some of the projects? Yeah, we were, does anyone remember the baud rate that we had to use? We did serial begin, yeah. I think it was like 9600. 9600, yeah, 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 exactly. Awesome. Okay. So we can actually do more than just print to the serial monitor, because it just seemed really dumb, in my opinion. Like, what am I doing here? I'm just looking at things on my computer screen. But actually, uh, serial print, the serial library function, has a lot more um, application than, for example, a Bluetooth system. So the Arduino communicates, this is, UART is the way in which the Arduino communicates to other devices. In this example here, I have the Arduino one, which is referred to as the master, and then the Arduino number two, which is referred to as a slave. If you press one more. 
Yeah, so in communication protocol, generally we say that the master is the microcontroller that is sending information and making things get done, and then the slave is the one that does things. So um, <laughs> next, it's important to understand that UART is an asynchronous form of communication. So we don't have any sort of clock signal to tell when something starts or stops. So actually what UART does and what these UART um, combinations do is they add and remove start and stop bits to your signal. That way the receiver knows when data is being sent in and when it's finished. In terms of the physical wiring of a UART device, you always have to have pairs of UARTs. One of them is the transmitter, and then the other is the receiver. So in a UART, they look identical. They all have the RX, which is the receiver pin, TX, transmitter pin, and then they have a common ground. And then another important thing about UART is that you always have to use the same baud rate. And that's why whenever we did ser whenever we use a serial monitor, we always had to, had to set the baud rate to 9600. If you set it to any other number, you wouldn't be able to communicate to your serial monitor. So that's something really important to understand about the UART. And um, there are a lot of downsides to this. So the other communication protocols we'll talk about will kind of figure that out or um, mitigate that. So how does the UART even work? First off, we have the first UART, which we refer to as a transmitter. And this receives data from the data bus, or just basically you can think of the data bus as any sort of information you're trying to send. It receives the information in parallel. And what the UART does is it takes that information, it adds stop, start, and sometimes parity bits, which you don't really need to worry about. The start and stop bits indicate for the receiver when the message is actually being, when that message actually starts and when it ends, because that way it knows when to actually uh, take in information and when to stop recording. So the transmitter adds these stop buttons and then it sends out uh, the data bit by bit from the transmitter pin. Now, the um, data is all being transmitted serially, which is very important to understand. And then it's going to be received by the receiver pin um, on the, the second UR. And this receiver pin receives the data bit by bit, um, and then it uh, removes all the stop and start bits um, from your information. That way you just get your uh, message that you were trying to send. And then it converts it back to uh, parallel data so that you can send it to the data bus or just whatever uh, form of communication you're trying to read it from. Yeah. So in terms of implementing UART, there are a couple of important functions to know. The first one is serial write, and then you add in some sort of value. And this just writes the value to the serial port. And the serial port is whatever the UR is connected to that you're trying to read information from. Generally, whenever, with, in previous projects, if you wanted to use serial write, you'd actually be writing it to the serial monitor, which is your serial port in this case. However, sometimes they can be other devices um, or anything that is connected to the tr receiver. The next one is serial.available, and this just checks if any data has actually been sent. So this returns a Boolean. So this is a really nice way of checking, oh, like has any of my data been actually sent? If it has, then I can do something. If it hasn't, then I need to keep on checking. The next function is serial read, and this reads in the values and then it returns in the incoming data available. Otherwise, it returns negative one. So this is a nice check. Um, to see, oh, am I receiving data, and what exactly am I receiving from the transmitter? So here's some pseudocode here. We'll go through it step by step. First off, let's say I um, instantiate a value called char byte read, and this is a global variable that will read in my data. Um, now in my void setup, I, I'm just trying to write to the serial monitor, so I'll write serial.begin 9600. So this is saying, um, this is my baud rate, and I'm going to apply it, um, and this is just going to send it to my serial monitor. Now, in the loop function, does anyone understand what this if statement is trying to ask? Yeah. If, like, data has been, if data has been sent, then you I, do the Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. And why is it that I'm doing it great, like, why am I initiating serial.available is greater than zero? What does serial.available return? Yeah. Uh, it's just because it's a Boolean. So yeah. Or it's an empty one or zero. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then I do byte read is equal to serial.read, and this just 
reads in the value that I'm getting, and then it sets it equal to the my variable, and then I just write out whatever that variable is. So this is a very simple implementation, but it's also a really great way to check to make sure that you are receiving information. Um, so in your capstone, you might want to do this before you try to do anything fancy with your, um, your function. Awesome. So now that we kind of understand what UART is, there are a couple of downsides to UART. I kind of already discussed, uh, you need the same baud rate, which can be really inefficient and just not um, very nice. Um, especially when we have more complex systems. In addition to this, you can only have one-to-one -one communication. In fact, UR only works in pairs. So that um, this image right here is actually not a viable uh, thing, so you can't actually do that with UR. In addition, um, you have to add these start and stop bits, which is just extra fluff, um, and you actually don't need to do this. And so that's why we're gonna move on to synchronous communication systems. Yeah? Is that like a single input, single output system? Uh, is UART a single input system? Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I can only have one input. I can't have load multiple um, transmitters and send it to the same receiver. Is that, does that answer your question? So now that, um, so that's the reason why we move towards SPI, which is Serial Peripheral Interface. SPI is a synchronous form of communication. So now I, um, instead of adding start and stop bits, I use a clock. So the master, which is generally our microcontroller, generates a clock signal. And this clock signal oscillates between low and high, and high to low. And this tells the receiver when the sample data should be, when, when the receiver should sample data. Um, and note here that we don't have to add any start or stop bits. We're just using a clock, which is a very consistent and easy thing to implement. Now in terms of actually wiring an SPI system, you need generally three plus N number of wires for N number of slaves. So the system does get a little bit more complex the more slaves you add. However, um, it's a lot nicer to implement because now I can have multiple slaves instead of just having uh, pairs of communication. So in this example here, um, if you guys can see, this, when the clock goes from low to high, this is referred to as the rising edge of a clock. When the clock goes from high to low, this is referred to as the um, falling edge of a clock. So in this particular system here, um, the system knows to, when to signal when at the rising edge of the clock. So at every rising edge, the receiver is going to um, record the data. So at this point here, it's going to record that it's a one, it's a one, and then at this point here, it's going to be zero. So that's how SPI works, and that's how you have the receiver knowing when to actually record data. All right, so um, this is the most simple case of SPI with one slave. There are three different pins. You have the S clock pin, which just generates the clock signal. You have the MOSI pin, which stands for master output slave input. And this means that you're sending a signal from the master to the slave. And then you have MISO, which is master input slave output. And that just means that you're sending a signal from the um, slave to the master. And then um, when you implement more slaves, the general system stays the same. The only thing that you're adding are these SS lines, which stands for slave select line. And this allows us to talk to multiple slaves um, without um, having multiple masters. So um, when the SS line is low, that means that I'm talking to that particular slave. And when the SS line is high, that means that I'm not talking to it. So in this particular example here, if SS2 was high, would I, um, or sorry, if SS2 was low, would I, which um, slave would I be talking? Perfect. And which color is that? Um, or which blue. is blue? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Do you want another snack? No, it's not good. Okay. Awesome. So uh, that's kind of the basic gist of how SPI works. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah. Why is it like when it's low it's being asked? That's just like kind of like standard, standard. Yeah. That's just kind of the standard system. So an overview of SPI, it is still a form of serial communication. Um, however, in this instance, we can actually talk to more than one slave, which is, again, very convenient. 
Um, it does require a little bit more wiring, so it is a little bit more complex. However, it does solve the issue of having only one-to-one -one communication with uh, the UART. An important thing to note here though is SPI, you still can only talk to one slave. It just means that you have multiple slaves that you can talk to. You just can only talk to one at a time. And then I have a link to the SPI library if you guys are interested in implementing this. Now the last form of serial communication is called uh, inter-integrated circuit or I squared C. And this stands for multiple masters, multiple slaves. So um, essentially what happens here is that the master calls the slave instead of through a slave select line, which is a physical hard wiring connection between the master and the slave. Instead what we have is an address that you can find on any sort of data sheet when you purchase a slave. And um, this slave address you'll add, um, that way you can actually communicate with these um, slaves. So because we have a slave address, instead of a physical hard wiring, this allows us to have multiple masters talking to multiple slaves all at the same time. So again, you can see that this can be really uh, nice for when you have a really complex system. In terms of this physical wiring, there are only two ports or two leads, the SDA, which is serial data, um, and this is just how the master and slave communicate to each other, and this, the S clock, which is just um, the clock signal that's generated by one of the masters. And we'll be going over how that works. So the first condition for I squared C is the start condition. And this just sets the SDA to a particular value depending on the reading, like if you're trying to read in to the master or read out. And then um, also the master switches the clock to low. And this is sent to all the slaves. The next, bit of, the next uh, portion of information that you have um, is the address frame. And again, you can find this on any sort of data sheet, but it's essentially a very unique address specific to that slave. That way the master can communicate with it. So again, um, this allows for multiple masters to be talking to people without needing wires. The um, read write bit is the most important one. This is set to high when the master is requesting data from a slave and then it's set to low when the master is sending data to a slave. So this is how um, the receiver determines whether or not they're trying to send or receive information. Then we have the ACK or NAC bits, and this is what the receiver actually adds to the message, and it tells you whether or not the receiver has received your message. So a zero means that it has received it, a one means that it hasn't. And then following the ACK NAC bit is your actual information that you're trying to send. This particular message is a 16-bit message, so that's why you have two ACNAT um, bits. Um, and then the final thing is that the master switches the clock to high, and then also the uh, serial data line to high as well. And then that's how the all the slaves know that the communication has stopped. All right, so a general review. For I squared C, it's a way to talk to multiple sensors at um, the same time. Um, there's also a link to a library for implementation. Just a quick note, instead of using like serial dot for serial communication, we're going to be using wire dot for I squared C. And unlike SPI, you can have multiple masters and multiple slaves without wiring. So that's basically serial communication in a nutshell. Uh, does anyone have any questions about it? I know it was a lot of information. I explained it perfectly, awesome. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and now we're going to move on to talking about arrays and functions. If you guys have done um, some programming, if you've done a few classes, this stuff might be a little bit repetitive to you, um, but for those of us who aren't as experienced with programming, we want to make sure that we go over it um, so that everyone um, can use this stuff in the upcoming project. So let's start off with arrays. Um, so you see at the top there, when you're declaring an array, you have sort of three parts, the array type, the array name, and the size of your array. And arrays are helpful ways to store a collection of data. So rather than just variables, which we've been using in the past, this one we can use, uh, store a bunch of things. And it basically works just like a little um, box, a little rectangle that has, has a bunch of boxes in it, um, which you can see from the picture like that. And then as you store information in the array, those boxes get um, filled up. This is the most common data structure that you would use, and it's also probably one of the easier ones. Um, and it also is really fast at accessing the data because it stores it um, consecutively in memory. Next slide. 
And so first thing, um, the type of an array uh, indicates what variable you're going to be storing in it. And so most commonly, you maybe you want to use like an int, a string, or a car. Um, and yeah, so there's some examples of that right there. Pretty simple though. Um, that's the um, syntax that you would use. Next slide. Uh, and then also we have the array size. So the size of the array tells us how many items we can fit inside of it. Um, and you want to make sure that you don't put more items into the array than you initialize it, the, it as having that size. So if you do like int small array three, don't try to put four things uh, inside of it because we'll have problems. And another important thing to know about arrays, which is really important and, and might cause problems, is that they're indexed starting at zero. So uh, later on we'll show examples of like accessing or putting things in, in arrays. You want to know that um, instead of like starting from counting at one, like the first thing that's in an array is actually the zero thing in the array. Um, and we'll show that in our example here. Um, so here's an example of an array. Say we wanted to um, store a bunch of test scores, five test scores. We would say int test scores five. And then here's an example at the top of individually putting things uh, inside the array. So as you can see, I started, when you want to then like access each part of the array, you use the same notation as when you set its size, but instead of um, giving it size, you give which, um, which part of the array, which box you want to access. So we set test scores 0 to 56, test scores 1 to 90, test scores 2 to 83, test scores 3 to 100, test scores 4 to 74. And you can see on that image that I put um, to the right there, that, that is what our array sort of looks like in memory. It's just like this rectangular box and it has those values now put into those places. And alternatively, you can also do it with this notation, um, which is um, it just some, some curly braces and you put them all next to each other just to save some, some space in your code so you don't have to write out that. Um, and then finally, if you want to index into an array to find out what you have, just like uh, what happened when we were trying to insert something in, you basically just write out. So if we wanted the first one, we would just say test score zero. If we wanted the, the second one, we would say test score one, uh, and so on. And then, so if we were to print this, it would um, output 56, because that's the first thing in our array. Yeah. And so some common errors that you might find when you use arrays is if you try to access an array out of, um, out of index, so, so further than the size that you set. So if we have test scores five, and we try to access um, score eight, we don't have an eight in our array because our array size is only five. So that is gonna access memory out of bounds. It's not ours, it could be anything there, and it's definitely gonna cause problems for our program. Um, also, easy to remember, if you try to access into item five, even though there are five, five items in the array, because they're indexed starting at zero, it goes zero, one, two, three, four, so there's not actually an item at the index five. So that is also something important and where you might have an error. Uh, and also if you try to use a value that has not been set yet, so if you just initialized in test scores five, but you haven't given it any values, so you haven't used like the curly brace or said in test score um, zero equals this for, for all of them, if you try to access one that has not had a value, you'll also get an error because you haven't set that data yet. So the, the computer doesn't really know what to do. Um, and now, uh, so it can actually, the problem is that it has undefined behavior. So that means that each compiler can kind of decide differently what it wants to do. So in some cases it will crash the program, in some cases it will like read data that is not actually there and think that it has the right data and you might not even know that your, pro that your program is running incorrectly. Um, so it can actually, which what's is why it's a more... In, like, hmm? uh, what? Well, what's going to happen in our... Uh, so the problem is that a lot of different things could happen. It could crash, it could um, keep working, but with like a random number. So if you had an int, it could just be like a random value that you wouldn't know what it is. So it could be something like crazy high or crazy low that could cause problems in the program. Uh, okay. Just in general, so it might warn you. Programming language doesn't have like any mechanism to check that even has a file type. Not necessarily. Um, it might, the, the compiler might, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'd have to check if it, if it gives a warning. I mean, you could try it out in Arduino IDE yourself to 
the cool part about programming, you can always just test things um, yourselves. But yeah, in general, just try to avoid it because it is undesirable. Um, the next thing that you'll want to do with arrays is uh, commonly, whenever you're using arrays, you'll want to access each item in the array um, because you're storing a lot of data and you want to, like, for instance, print out each one of them. And so to do this, we just use a for loop. And so you'll get uh, used to doing this notation. It's really common. You just do for um, int i equals 0, and then i is less than 5 because that's the size of the array, and then i plus plus to iterate um, through. And then, for instance, there, I'm just serial.println um, test score value for each of them. And again, remember that there's an index starting at 0. So that's why we do in i equals 0, not like in i equals 1. Yeah. And then finally, one thing this will come up uh, in the project is that if we want to represent a grid of data, there's sort of two ways that we can do it. One way is to have a two-dimensional array, which is, um, if you look on the right, we say like int array 2d 4 4. And then each of the indexes into the array is now going to have like two of the square brackets there. To, to index into each one. And that can be helpful for us to think about where things are in the array ourselves. Um, but when it comes to doing things like printing out values or um, performing other calculations, it gets a little bit more complicated because we have to use things like nested loops, which you see on the right. Um, and then the other way to do it would to be um, use a 1D array and then just have the numbers um, sort of keep going as it overlaps which this way is a bit harder for us to think about like when we say like, oh, uh, let me index into six. Like we don't necessarily know where that is on the grid, just like as humans, but uh, the computer doesn't really care about that. Um, and so sometimes it can lead to easier code. Like we would just have a single line loop still. Um, and yeah. May we use multiple arrays? Hmm? May we use yeah, that could be an alternative if you wanted to do like an array for each um, line of, of the, the array. So if we had like one array for this line, one array for this one. But in a way, that's sort of what this is doing. What it's doing when you do an array 2D, you're basically just making an array that stores each of those four arrays that you would have. Um, which is why if you see like it's just like 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, like you index into the array to get which one you want to do and then, then you would index into which one you want to get horizontally. So it sort of is doing that in a way. Um, yeah, but any other questions about arrays? May we use a dynamic array? Um, yeah. If you want to program it, then go for it, for sure. Is it supported? I'm not actually sure if it's supported in Arduino IDE. You'd have to um, try it out. Or does the Arduino support other SP, like a SP uh, no, it doesn't. By yeah, no, you'd have to code if you wanted to use like a vector. You'd have to code it yourself, unfortunately. That's too bad. Yeah, it's too bad. There's some libraries out there. I, like I was looking into this for for other stuff. There are some libraries that other people have made for standard containers. So you could also try to look for those. But there's no like one set standard one for whatever reason. I think it's because like when you're using an Arduino, you want to use less overhead because it's kind of typically you want like a faster application, and the, the other SPL containers have a bit more overhead. Um, but yeah, that's arrays. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, so now let's move on to functions. So functions can help us in C++ organize our code by separating them out into different uh, portions, which we can then name. Um, so we've already seen some functions before, um, like even void setup and loop are functions in and of themselves. Um, and also you might have written one for your iPodduino project. Um, but the way that they work is that you have a return type, and then you name the function, and then you can also pass in parameters to the function. Um, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, so first of all, re return type. Every function must return something to where it was originally called, which essentially means when you call it, it will like uh, return a value, so it will like become that value, basically. But uh, you can return any number of things. If you don't want to return anything, we have a word for that, and that's void, which just means return nothing. Uh, don't return a value. And then anything else, int, car, string, whatever you want. 
So if you want to, um, how do you return inside of a function? This is sort of like um, what functions will actually look like. So if we had a void one, we would say void my func one. We don't have any parameters here. And then whatever code you would want to write, and then you just say return. That's how you return for if you're void. And then if you're any other type, you want to return an actual value. So say if we were int there, I made int my var five, we want to return my var. We want to return some integer. Um, yeah. And now we have function parameters. So inside of the function, um, we want to, if we want to work on things inside of the function and we want to give them values that maybe change each time. So for instance, I have this sum function. If you wanted to make a function to sum two numbers, we want to then give it like the numbers um, that it can use to sum them and get the result back. And so that's what we use parameters for. Um, oh, I see that I said return type. That's supposed to say parameters, my bad. Um, in the blue, but um, yeah. You can have any number of parameters and they can be whatever type you want. Um, and just like this, int result equals a plus b and then we can return that. So that way, when you call it later, you pass them in like an actual values or variables that have um, values. So we would say like int my int equals sum three two. And then if we were to do that, that would print out five. Um, but yeah. And so in the Arduino IDE, it's generally good um, practice to write your functions after um, void setup and void loop. Um, yeah, that, that's just a good place to do them. Does anybody have any questions about functions? Yeah. Can you go back to the last slide? Mm -hmm. um, do we have to prioritize topics first? Like put it in the top? Yeah. Uh, I found that you don't need to unless you have a, um, uh, like if you were to say int a equals five, I think what like uh, I forgot what that's called. Uh, but if you default parameter? yes, default parameter. If you want to give it a default parameter, then you do have to. It's probably good practice to do that, um, especially if you're used to it. But you don't technically have to um, if you don't have any default parameters. All the values that you move into the top. Uh, it's so this is just a convention. It should still work if you move it to the top. But by convention, like if you're reading your code. You want to get to the main part of your code first so that you can see what's actually happening in it, and then all the different functions that you can do. So it's mainly a readability, um, just convention thing. Any other questions? Okay. It didn't tell us that it needs to be at three. Okay. Without further ado, the project that I've been building um, this quarter, Game Boy now. You get to make your very own video game console. Who doesn't love that? I love that. Um, so about the project. Um, in this project, you're going to be making your own game console. And you're going to be doing two main parts of it, obviously, hardware and software. So we're going to have a joystick, an OLED display, and then on the software, you're going to be coding tic-tac-toe. And also, there's going to be a competition later if you want to um, make your own individual game which will be super fun. It's gonna be due two weeks from today and we're also gonna have four sessions. But I wanted to give you a little bit of background on um, the stuff. So first of all, the joystick. Joysticks work by having two potentiometers in them, on one on the x-axis and one on the y-axis. So that means that they return an analog value, which basically gives you a number between like um, zero and 1023 for the x-axis and for the y-axis. So that's how you know, like, for all 360 degrees around it, you know the exact position that it is based on that x and y value. And it, uh, the ones that we are using also have a switch on them, just like if you have a game controller where you can press down on the joystick. Uh, the ones that we're using also have that. Um, so this is the pinout for the joystick. It has just ground, five volts, and then VRX, uh, that's for the potentiometer, um, in the x-axis, so that's going to require analog, uh, an analog pin. Same thing with VRY, and then the switch pin will be digital output. And I also have a link there if you want more information about joysticks. Um, and next, we're going to talk a little bit about displays. So there's a lot of different kinds of displays that you may or may not have heard of uh, from like a long time ago. You may have heard of cathode ray tubes, CRTs, thin film transistor, PFC, quantum dot display, QLED, AMOLED, E-ink. There's a lot of displays. The two main ones that we're gonna talk about uh, are LCD and OLED. These are the ones that you might wanna use in your own 
Arduino projects, those are the ones you would basically choose from um, for simple purposes. So let's first talk about LCDs. LCD actually stands for Liquid Crystal Display, which sounds pretty awesome, <laughs> not gonna lie. Um, but basically it uses uh, a material which is considered to be a liquid crystal along with polarizing filters which um, allow electrical signals to control whether or not light passes through the screen. So it has a backlight at the end and then based on the signals that you send to it, it decides where, what parts of it are allowed to send light out, um, which allows us to write messages and, and display pixels. And so the pros are that it's very cheap and it's pretty long lasting. But the cons are that because it needs like the backlight and some of, and it has like a lot of layers, it's a bit thick. Um, and also it's not as good with dark colors because it's not actually, because um, it's like, it's just blocking the light physically to get through. So it's not as great with uh, actually producing dark colors. And we are not gonna be using LCDs in our Binguino project because instead we are gonna be using OLEDs which OLED stands for Organic Light Emitting Diodes, or just Organic LEDs. But basically, they're a newer type of display that uses um, organic emitters, so organic LEDs, which means that they're just like carbon-based. Um, and they emit light when electricity is applied. So basically, it's as if you have uh, a display of just a whole bunch of LEDs, but because they're organic, they can uh, carbon-based, we can make them really, really small. And, and just like apply them as just like a layer basically, which is what allows us um, to get these beautiful displays. They're a lot thinner and they also are more energy efficient and show truer colors. So often when you hear people talk about OLEDs, they say it has a much like deeper black, um, which it's actually really pretty. I, I like OLED screens. Um, but also it, because it uses, the materials that it uses often have a shorter lifetime than LCDs and because they're newer, they're a bit more expensive. And we are gonna be using OLEDs in our game project, and they're dope, they're awesome. Here is the pinout for OLEDs. You, it uses I squared C communication, so that's why it has an SDA, an SCL, which is serial data, serial clock, and then just five volts and ground, um, pretty standard. Yeah. Okay, and we are also gonna be doing a work session for it. Uh, which is going to be a week from today on April 6th, and it should just be in the IEEE lab. And we want to, this project is a bit more um, intensive than other projects, so try and get, try to start working on it earlier, and come to the work session with problems or questions that you may have. And by the end of the work session, we definitely want you to try to have the, at least the hardware portion of it done, um, so that you can get on to coding an actual game. And also, just like the iPod Duino project, uh, but even better, we're gonna have a competition. You can modify hardware, add components, buzzers, LED buttons, like you can make it however you want it to be. And also, more, you can program your own game. Whoever makes Tetris is my favorite person ever. It's, <laughs> it's actually hard. If you're not good at programming, don't try. It's, it'll take a lot of time. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of cool games, like maybe you want to make a Pong, Brick Breaker, anything. If you make a game, I will, you'll be my friend. Um, so yeah. They're already your friend. Yeah, yeah, you'll be more of my friend. Best friend status, I guess. Um, but yeah, make sure you keep your game we know project together. Don't like disassemble it, because we're actually going to have you guys show it off yourself after lecture, two weeks from today when the project is due. You're going to actually be able to show off um, and maybe play some other people's games. Uh, and hopefully, it should be a fun time. Win prizes and lab bugs. Yeah, be fun. Hey, thanks, thanks for coming time. out. I know it's really late, but yeah, we does, appreciate it nonetheless. Does anybody have any final questions about the project or the lecture um, you before? Can use recursion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can definitely use recursion. <laughs> 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 you definitely should.